My name is Richard Dunkel. Okay, how would you like to be addressed? Is Richard or Pap? Or Dick. Dick? Dick or Pap. Dick would be more appropriate. Okay. That's no problem. Um, we're here today just to hear about your experiences when you were in the um, Army Air Corps. And um, why don't we start off with um, what, what made you join the uh, military? Well, to begin with, I was drafted. And uh, I guess I worked at Glen Martin aircraft factory building B-26s prior to my entering in service. Okay. So tell me, when, when did you um, go into the military? 3rd of March, 1943. Okay. So you got a draft card in the mail or something like that. Tell me about that experience when you received that. Well, I got a draft card in the mail, but I was working in Baltimore, so they wanted to send me to the service from there, induct me in Baltimore. Then I asked them if I could be transferred back home to Pennsylvania to be inducted. And they took care of that and accommodated me on the situation. Okay. So that's where I went from Reading, PA. I was drafted and I went to New Cumberland, PA. Did you know you were going to be flying at the time? Or? No, I didn't. But uh, when I got there and filled out the forms, my resume and everything, the sergeant there told me, he says, you're going to the Air Force. He says, with your prior experience working in an aircraft factory, and uh, you uh, would like to fly. He asked me if I'd like to fly. I said, I would love to. Okay. So tell me so, about your training that you, you went through. Well, <clears throat> from New Cumberland, they sent us down to Miami Beach. That was hard to take. It was in the early spring. And... Uh, we only stayed there for about 13 days of basic training. And then I was shipped off from there to Harlingen, Texas. We went in an old <clears throat> coal burning train and we looked, uh, pardon the expression, but we looked like black people when we got off of it due to the coal suit and everything. But that was a long ride all around the Gulf of Mexico. You know, Harlingen is right next to the Mexican border. And that's where I went to gunnery school. I spent about three months there in, in gunnery school. Did you like it? I loved it, yeah. They had a bad experience in gunnery school, which I'd like to point out. But uh, we flew in AT-6s, and they had flexible, what they call a flexible 30 caliber. And we used to fly in a tow target sleeve. Another aircraft pulled this tow target sleeve, and you had colored ammunition so they could tell who hit the target and who didn't hit it. So <clears throat> we went out and he said, if you get rid of your ammunition, he says, I'll give you a good ride. So coming back, they had these big white fluffy clouds and they took us through there and got me wet <laughs> because <laughs> the canopy was open on the AT-6, but he gave me a good ride. We went back and we landed at the base and uh, my buddy and I, by the name of uh, yeah, I can't even think, I can't even think of his name now. Junior, we call him Junior. But anyway, we were standing in the operations waiting for our scores to come in. And we were standing in the doorway. Well, out in front of the operations office, there was a Lockheed Hudson standing there. And that had a turret on it. And we, he was leaning up against the wall. We had parachutes on yet, and I was getting tired, so I just moved away from him and stood on the other side, and just like that, broom, about four or five shots come out of that turret. Caught him right in the neck, and I can see him today yet, just going down, slouching down to the floor with a gurgling sound. And the last thing I remember him, they had him on the litter, taking him out. He picked his arm up and looked at his watch. But, uh, and he was, he was a heck of a nice kid. He was young. And it was a short life for him. Mm -hmm. Well, what an introduction to combat that was. Terrible. Can't even imagine. No. And he was a good buddy of mine. He slept up in the top bunk. Connors was his name. Yeah. 
But then uh, we went through the training, the rest of the training, and uh, we shot on uh, open range. They had uh, a, a target on the track, and we shot with turrets and <clears throat> flexible guns and things like that. I qualified with an expert rating. I was one of the few guys that had any experience with shooting. We had a lot of fellows come in there from the cities, big cities. They didn't know how to handle a gun. They didn't know what a rifle was or anything. And I loved to shoot trap. And down there they had skeet ranges. Well, I couldn't get anybody to go out there with me. These guys, they weren't interested in trap shooting. But I loved it. So I got some guys to go out. and uh, We shot a lot of skeet in those days. We had the old Browning recoil shotguns. They were automatics, but when they recoiled, it give you that second jolt. <laughs> so that was about the end of my training then, as far as uh, the gunnery school. From there, I went to Keesler Field. <clears throat> Since I was in the Air Force, they were going to make me, and I had the background of aircraft. They sent me to Keesler Field Mechanic School. Well, I was there till. I'd say the fall of 43, and uh, learned all about the B-24, the engines and everything, and I tell you, it was something, what an experience for me. So tell me about, um, you've gone through training, and now you've got to get over to Europe, or did they tell you you were going to Europe, and then you have, you have that ride by boat, I assume. So tell me about that experience from going from training to... Well, from training, I went, I got vacation, delay en route, and I had to report to Salt Lake City to form our combat crew. And uh, I was only there about 10 days, and then we went to Boise, Idaho as a crew, and we got some overseas combat training, flight training, made drive bomb runs and things like that, you know, flew a mission to Seattle, we used the shipyards out there for a target, and uh, that then I had but three months of that in Boise, Idaho, at Gowan Field. And from there we went to Lincoln, Nebraska. We were going, I got our orders to go overseas. We went to Lincoln, Nebraska. We picked up a brand new B-24. And we had it painted with the Vaga girl, like everybody else did in those days. And uh, we called it Classy Chassis. And uh, we were all happy about that. When they, Got into that plane then. We took a practice flight, a training flight there at Lincoln. And we come down here, we had a cracked landing gear. So we had to wait to get that repaired. And uh, after that was finished, we started from Lincoln, Nebraska. We went to Grenier Field, New Hampshire. We stayed overnight there. From there, we went to Goose Bay, Labrador which was quite an experience when you see a place like that. You come in on the runways, they had snow piled up maybe 20 feet on either side. You couldn't run off the runway, so it was convenient that way. But we only spent about two nights there. We had some bad weather. We spent two nights because we were going to fly out of there at 10 o'clock at night so that they could navigate. We went to Iceland from there. But when we got to Iceland, we landed there and we stayed there for the night. And uh, we had some whiskey, some candy bars. We were loaded with goodies. So we come back out the next morning. We took off. We were going to England. Some guy said, hey, where are the candy bars? Where are the whiskey bars? They relieved us of them. We had a guard on the aircraft and somebody relieved us of the whiskey and the candy bars and everything. So that didn't make us very happy. <laughs> so we landed in, we had quite an experience. We were landing in Valley, Wales. And uh, they had the same coordinates there at Valley, Wales, as the, the other place, the Irish Free State. And in the Irish Free State, we started to land there. And we were coming in, the, they were shooting flares, and then all of a sudden the pilot said, well, I'm going to go around. He went up, and they said, well, we don't see you in the traffic pattern from over at the air base. We don't see you in the traffic pattern. Said, Where are you? 
And here we were landing at the wrong place. We would have landed there, we'd have been interned for the rest of the war. But we just made a touch and go and got out of there and got back to Valley Wales. And there they took that beautiful airplane away from us. And that was the end of that craft. They sent us to what they called uh, Randall Field of the Air. They called that base over there in England. They sent us there and loaded us in trucks. And we went out to our base in Mendelssohn, England. And uh, that was a B-24 base. And when we come out the next morning, we were going to this, they assigned us to an airplane, which was called Loretta Ann. I don't know where the name came from, but uh, it's in on the, the computer. We have a whole history of my whole base on the computer, but it's listed in there. And when I saw that thing, I thought, oh, God, this looks like an old beat up thing. It had patches on it and everything else. But the last three numbers were 602. And I remember we finished 22 missions in that plane without too many problems. We had almost every mission we came back, we had holes of some sort from the flak. We're starting to talk about your missions. I'd like to hear the experience and what you felt on your very first mission you had to fly, combat the, mission. The first, okay. The first combat mission that we flew, they call it a milk run, which uh, really wasn't a milk run because we lost a couple of airplanes through it. And uh, it was quite an experience. That, I didn't know what flak was all about, you know, and uh, you look out the front of the aircraft and I had a good view being in the top turret. And uh, when I looked out there and I saw all this flak, it made me nervous. And I'll tell you, there are no atheists in the sky. I did a lot of praying by myself. I'd pull those guns up along my head, you know, <laughs> I had my flak suits all around me. and. Uh, it was quite an experience, it was nervous. But you know, the guys that were already had some missions in, they slept in our barracks, and they gave you a, try to scare you, I guess. And uh, it was it, it was quite an experience to know that you're up there in the air and somebody's shooting at you. Mm -hmm. But uh, after a while, you sort of get used to it. We didn't mind too much. I hated the weather more than anything, in, England because you take off in the morning beautiful day and you come back at night and you cloud covered rain and I didn't like coming down through those clouds flying in a formation when you let down from maybe 25,000 feet and you come down you go th right through the clouds and they stayed together that there had me a little nervous but uh, we never had any problem <clears throat> Tell me about your scariest mission you've flown on. The scariest mission that I ever flew on, I think, was uh, we were going into Cologne, I think it was, and uh, we were flying the high element, and all of a sudden the pilot says, controls are froze, we can't. I can't control the aircraft, we're just climbing. We kept climbing, we climbed right out of the group. There we were all alone. The pilot said, prepare to bail out. Well, when he said that there, it, you know what that would do. That uh, kind of made me nervous. But I got out and I started to shoot flares right away when we left the group. I shot some flares. And next thing you know, we had two fighters on each side, two P-51s. The green flares meant that we were in fighter escort. So they escorted us back and after a while we hit a barrage of flak and it rattled, it knocked the heck out of that aircraft. We had later found out when we landed, we had a hole in the bottom of the wing about three feet like that. And uh, we also were running low in fuel and we were coming across the English Channel where we started to f throw everything out that we could, at it, guns and everything, because it was get rid of the weight. And I saw the White Cliffs of Dover there, and we were down just about level with them. And I said to the pilot, I said, we're going to make it, we're going to make it. He said, we're going to make it. So we got there, and the first thing we saw was an English base. And we went right in and landed. 
So that was quite an experience when you they say bail out, get prepared to bail out. Well, everybody's running around in the airplane, putting parachutes on and everything else. That gets you a little nervous because I didn't want to bail out. <laughs> but uh, that was one of the, I guess, uh, most exciting missions. But uh, one of the other ones, when the last one we flew in a B-24, we went to Kiel Harbor, Germany. That was a submarine pens. And that wound up to be the worst mission we had in the group. Uh, some guys flew right out of the squadron. I seen two aircraft go. They went to Sweden. And to me, I seen all the preps. The propellers were still running and no feathered props or anything. I didn't see any damage, but uh, they left the group and they went to Sweden. Well, they were interned there for the rest of the war. But when we got back, we had, they, our aircraft was condemned. It was put up for junk. We didn't fly it again. That's how bad it was beat up. We had one engine out and uh, had lots of holes in it. But that was the end of it. Then we went into B-17s. How many missions did you fly up altogether? 33. 33. Now you're a top turret gunner, so tell me about that. I mean, every mission is its own unique event. But tell me about uh, times where you've actually seen fighter enemy fighters coming. Well, actually, our group was fortunate. And when we had training, we had a commander that was heck on flying tight formations. He knew about it. It was uh, he had flying experience. He was overseas, and he knew what to do. So he made us fly day in and day out in training. Tight formation, tight formation. And that kept the fighters away from us. Because you know you have all that concentration in one area and you're going to fly into that. No. They'd pick on a squadron or a bomb group that was flying a loose. And they'd, they'd be the ones that get hit. We very seldom got hit by fighters. We didn't lose a bomber to a fighter until D-Day. Day after D-Day. We lost four bombers in the traffic pattern. A JU-88 and an ME-110 came, followed us through, and got into the traffic pattern and shot us down. I wasn't in it, though. I wasn't shot down. There. I was on the ground, and everybody down there was going crazy. I'm going to ask you about D-Day in a minute, but tell me about the times you're in the top turret. Have you ever had to fire your guns? I fired it once or twice, that's all. I, there was fighters out there, but they didn't get within range of us. But like I said, we had a good tight formation and it didn't bother us. They went for the loose outfits. If you're firing your, um, I guess there were 50 calibers, um, if you were to, to fire, how long would the ammo last? Well, if, if you would continue firing, you'd burn out the barrels. That's what would happen. But uh, you only fired short bursts. And I never ran out of any ammunition or anything like that. So they gave you enough to work with? Yeah. We had two cases of boxes where they came out of. They were in a belt. They come up on both sides. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about your, your D-Day experience. You knew at some point something was going up. I'm sure they, you didn't know exactly what was going on. But what, what, how did they prep you for that, that day? They prepped us by telling us we were going to fly three missions. That was the one thing. But then we got bad weather. In fact, the first two missions, we brought our bombs back. We didn't even drop them. And uh, the th third mission we did go in, went into France and dropped on troops, uh, the Germans' supplies that were coming in because they were caught short in the, in the invasion. And uh, so we bombed the uh, railroad yards and things like that so they couldn't bring the troops in and ammunition. The relationship to, you know, we're all familiar with uh, Sword, Juno, Gold Beaches, and the names of the beaches. What geography were you close to, or what city were you close to when you were um, assigned to targets? Uh, Cannes was one, and uh, Potty Calais was one, Cherbourg, those were the towns that we bombed <clears throat> prior to the 
invasion. Those are all cities that I'm familiar with just from the series Band of Brothers oh, yeah. and reading all the books that yeah. they've got too. So that's why I had asked that. So you flew three missions. One was successful. One was successful. The other two we aborted and come back because of the weather. What were your concerns about the troops and ships and everything else out there? You had loads of bombs. You had to make sure you didn't. You weren't an issue of friendly fire. Was that on your mind at all? No. Well, uh, there, there were no fighters. No German fighters were in the area at the time because they weren't ready for it. They were surprised, and uh, I guess Rommel, whoever had the the troops over there, he was on a birthday vacation, and they really snafu'd. But uh, I don't know. Is the thing that I was fascinated with is all the ships on that channel, how they could keep from running into each other. That was the most fascinating part of it. It seems to be a common uh, yeah. statement that yeah. a lot of people make. But let yeah. me ask you this: the magnitude of D-Day. When did you realize how big of a deal that was? Oh, not till days after. Yeah, we didn't realize it. Because it was quite a secret, you know. Overlord was the name of it. And, uh, yeah, that's about, oh, you know, when you fly, you, you're up there and uh, you don't see too much. You see flak and things like that. But to look down, if when you dropped your bombs, all you saw was dust. The big dust clouds coming up. That's all you'd see. So when you're, when you're flying, it's a lot of hours. Was it safe to say it was a lot of boredom followed by a lot of uh, excitement? Well, yeah, it was. The boredom was till you got up and, flew and got in your formation. They were firing flares. The lead plane would fly, fire flares, and you would form on him. And that would take, excuse me, that would take time. But that's where the boredom was. But once you crossed the channel, there was no more boredom. Because all you see was flack. And I didn't like that. <laughs> like I said, we, I know when we got on the bomb run, you'd never, when you turn on the IP over the target, you'd never see any fighters because uh, they know that. And what I would do, I put my head down between the guns on the, IP, on the bomb run and I just prayed to God because that was the worst part on the bomb run. And once it was bombs away, then we were on our way home. Then we were relaxed. But you still got flack, no matter where you went. They had the guns. Mm -hmm. So the one mission I flew, we had a bomb hang up, which was quite an experience. One of the, the bottom bomb hung up on the right side. And I could feel it when the bombs went out. The, the bombs hitting that one because I felt these jarring, you know. When you let the bombs go, that plane jumps up, you know. But uh, then on the way back, we had to get rid of that bomb. We just didn't want to drop it anywhere because we were in uh, territory now that was uh, out of the war, you know, so to speak. We we're heading over towards Zyder Zay. It was that's flooded uh, land that they did over there. And uh, I got the armor gunner. He got a screwdriver and a pair of pliers, and we went back and they opened the bomb bay doors, and I had to hold on to him. He was reaching across the bomb bay doors, and I had a hold of his strap. I don't know what would have happened if he fell, because I don't think I could have held him. But uh, I was there to hold him anyway. But uh, I braced myself in the bomb bays, and he finally got over and got rid of the bomb. Well, that made us happy because that was a live bomb. Any flak would hit that, that would have exploded. So uh, once we got rid of that, we dropped it in the water. Kill a few fish? Uh, probably. <laughs> but that was, that was the end of that day. Um, do you guys have any questions that are burning right now? I, I'm curious. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between flying in the B-24 and the B-17 and kind of your impressions of the plane and were they used differently or for different kinds of missions? B-24 and the B-17s all flew the same missions, same targets and everything. But I guess I just loved the B-24 because I had all the history and 
went to school and learned all about it and everything. And although it didn't look like an airplane, when we first saw it, my co-pilot says, look at that pee poor, man's pee poor idea of an airplane. There was it. They call it the boxcar, you know, the flying boxcar. Well, we all laughed about that. He was an ex-paratrooper, my co-pilot. Woodrow W. Sneed was his name. But anyway, that was uh, why I guess I liked the B-24. It was faster. You got into the target and you got out faster than the B-17. The B-17, I don't know what they cruised at at the time, but I know we were faster. And that's why we went into B-17s. Our whole division went into B-17s from the ones that were flying B-24s. So they could have better control of them going in and out of the target. Everybody flew the same speed. When you had B-24s in there, the 24s were faster, so it didn't work too good that way as far as the bomber stream. But uh, B B-17, I think, has just uh, got too much praise. I don't know. I guess I'm prejudiced to the B-24 and the 17. But I... Today, yet, I still like the B-24 better than the B-17. Now, the B-17 took quite a whooping, you know. It took a lot of beating. Todd, any questions for me? Yeah, tell me about the, um, the climate in the plane, the cold, and just, the, just what, what was it like inside the plane once you got up to altitude? I can't hear him. Tell me, you're, you're inside the aircraft. It's, it's not a pressurized cabin. No. So tell me about that experience, how you felt. Oh. Well, when you were in there and you get up to 20,000, it was 60 below zero outside Fahrenheit. And uh, you had heated suits, which you plugged in, and they worked wonderful. It was just like uh, heavy underwear, and you wore that underneath your flying suit. But you plugged that in, you plugged it in for your gloves and heated. The only thing that wasn't heated was your face. I mean, you had an oxygen mask and the oxygen mask used to freeze. You had to keep squeezing it to keep the ice from forming in the oxygen mask. But, uh, and it was so noisy inside. Of course, you wore your headset most of the time. It didn't bother you then. Did you ever have a day where the, the electrical to your suit failed? No, I mean, didn't. Never had one. Some guys did have them, but they always had spares, a, a spare in the aircraft that you could, a blanket that you could heat, you know, if somebody got injured or anything, flack, or hurt them or anything like that, you had this heated blanket that you wrap them in. But uh, other than that, they worked pretty good. Pretty comfortable? Yeah, except for the flak suit. Now you had a flak suit that was all plates plate steel on both sides of you, and they had a red tag here, so if you got a bail out or anything, you just pull that tag and the flak suit falls off of you. You wore that over the top of everything else. And me, I confiscated extra pieces, and I used to tie them around my turret for more protection. I had one piece of flak come through the turret and bounced off my flak helmet which was spent, you know, and it fell down, and I had that piece for years, and somehow I lost it. But uh, other than that, uh, it was comfortable in the aircraft. Did the time go by quickly? Well, not fast enough when you're in combat, <laughs> you know, but uh, it went pretty fast. Dick, I want to bring you back to training. Yeah. I, I've been on rifle ranges sometimes, and uh, the guys who really know how to shoot, they might start to cause a little mischief. Like, I've seen guys, instead of shooting at the target, shooting at the frame and trying to knock the whole target down and yeah. have a sergeant yelling at them. You ever see anything like that in any of the gunnery training you've done? I didn't have too much experience with that. I did have some firing on the range. We fired with the, most of the pistol. We had the thirty eight revolvers that we had, we were issued. We used to fire those, but we also fired uh, out of turrets 
on a they had a moving target on the railroad track like so to speak and we used to fire at that they had a big target on there and you had colored ammunition to see who did the scoring on it you know but uh and the other thing one thing i did have in gunnery training we were on the back of a truck i don't know what they called them two and a half ton or whatever they were but they had a platform on the top of there and you had a shotgun and they had a track and on both sides there were targets trap houses and as you drove down through there these targets would go out i really that was fun that was moving moving base they called that but every chance i got i'd get out there to do that <laughs> i loved it did you like being over in england yeah england was a good place to be the other thing i failed to mention we went to what they call the flak shack we got two weeks in between our tour. They flew us up to, can't think of the name of the town anymore, but it was over on the English coast, south of Scotland. And uh, we stayed there for two weeks. Well, all you did was party. Uh, I never drank so much booze in my life, I guess. <laughs> in those two weeks, trying to relax from everything else, you know, and. One thing I failed to ask is, is, how old were you at the time? At the time, I was 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. When was your last day there? How did, how did they, did you know you were having a last day? Or how did they, how did you go I, from England back? I didn't know that it was going to be our last mission because our pilot flew two missions as a co-pilot to get the experience. And uh, when we got to 30, he got to 35, we only had 33, the crew. So I was surprised when they told us we were going home. We come back to the base, back to our unit, and they said, the pilot's finished, the rest of the crew is finished too, you can go home. That was a good feeling. I can imagine it was. <laughs> yes, the only thing I didn't like about that, going home, I had pictures, not pictures, but film. I don't know how many films I had, undeveloped. And they scared us so bad when we were getting ready to board the ship and we had to turn in a lot of stuff, our guns and all that stuff, to go home. They scared us so bad that I turned them in the film. They said, if anybody has any film and we catch you, you're going off the shipment. Well, that was probably so much bunk, but uh, it, it worked. I lost all that film. I don't know what they ever did with it. Somebody got some good pictures. What was it of? It was in flying. When we were flying, I took pictures out of the tur top turret. I had one where two aircraft flew together, two B-24s. I don't know if they got in the slipstream or what it was, but the both of them got together and they locked and they just pancaked down like that. And the first thing you look for is parachutes. And... Uh, you count them, see how many come out, and then you report it when you go back for interrogation. But that was uh, quite an experience. I had good pictures. We've probably seen them on the History Channel. Somebody else. Could. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so tell yeah. me about at the end of a mission, you land, you, you've got to be debriefed. Tell me about the debriefing. Well, when we went in there, the first thing they do is they give you a shot of whiskey. Or some guys just drink hot chocolate or whatever. But uh, they sit you down and then they ask you what you saw, you know, and what kind of fighters. I know the one mission when we come back, we got to report the jet, the 262, ME 262. Well, one of them made a pass above us and we got to see it. Some of us got to see it, some didn't see it. But that was, they were quite interested in that. But uh, other than that, we told them what flak you had and things like that, how much, what the fighter experience was. And we were fortunate. Our group was never had an aircraft shot down by a fighter, except the four that we lost in the pattern, in the landing pattern. That was, uh, that was about the extent of that. But we did lose, uh, I think it was 47 planes all together from to flak mm -hmm. yeah tell me um just so we have it the uh the unit you were with 
the 34th bomb group. That's the 8th Air Force. 8th Air Force, yeah. Okay. And they trained in Blythe, California. That's where they trained. And they were more or less an instruction outfit. They were training other crews to go overseas, to go into bomb groups and things. That's all they were doing was training. And it just happened that Hap Arnold came and landed at that base one day. And we had a guy by the name of Colonel Eaton. And he was a good friend of Hap Arnold. And he requested our group to go into combat overseas, form a group and go over. And that's what happened. That's how they formed in Blythe, California. They formed it and then they didn't go over until April of 44. So you've heard of the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes. Was your unit involved with it? We weren't involved that I know of. We could have been because they spent most of their time with the 15th Air Force down in Italy. But some of them, toward the, after the war was moving, uh, they did get up into England and were flying up there, but I never knew of them. But I did meet some of them at the air show over here. Tuskegee, yeah. And I thanked them for their escorting us. I said, you guys did a good job. Yeah, that's where I found out about them. Did you see the movie, The Memphis Bell? The what? The Memphis Bell. The Memphis Bell. That, to me, is the biggest disappointment in a film that I ever saw. It showed no respect to their officers. The crews, they never carried on like that. Not that I know of, in my experience. But uh, un understand, our crew was like a family. We were like brothers. We didn't salute the uh, officers all the time and stuff like that. Only if you were out in public. But other than that, it was Tom, Joe, or Harry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my pilot we called Bill, Bill Marsden. But, Any movies uh, that you have seen that you do like related to World War II? Not really. I, I haven't seen the best pictures I've seen related to World War II were on the History Channel. I did not movies. I didn't see him in any movies. The documentaries you see yeah. on your channel? Are they pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy those. In fact, I saw uh, one mission here some time ago. They were flying a mission. And I think it was in the Hamburg. And I could relate to that because I looked on my chart and we flew to Hamburg that day. Now, whether we were in that or not, on the film because well you send 1200 aircraft in on a mission that's a maximum effort there was in those days a maximum effort 1200 and that's just a bomber stream one group after the other it's got to be an impressive sight to the enemy yeah it is it was an impressive sight for us when we laid down there on the aircraft on the out on the strip and watching the english towing these gliders for they were going to land up in Denmark. It was right before the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, my co-pilot said, there's a lot of guys nervous there and probably peeing in their pants. <laughs> he, was, he was an ex-paratrooper. <laughs> For chronology's sake, what was, um, when did you leave England then? What, what? When did I leave? I left on, uh, I think it was the 2nd of November. What year? I'm 44, yeah. I was home before, the, during the Battle of the Bulge was in existence right then. I had two brothers that were over there. My one brother was an ambulance driver. He drove from the front lines to the aid station. Terrible job. He said he never had, he never thought he would live through it. He couldn't, because of picking people up, you know, maimed and everything like that. He received a bronze star for one, I never did know until shortly before he passed away how he got it. But he went in, a fellow was in a minefield and he had his leg torn off. And he went in that minefield and drug that guy out and got him in the ambulance and took him back to the aid station. And when he got back there, he said he died. But he got the bronze star for that. Let me ask you something. Relating to movies and stuff, they love to use the F-bomb in movies for whatever reason. Did everybody, what, everybody curse like that? Like you see portrayed today? No, no. 
I understand a lot of guys, you know, they use the F word a lot, but uh, on my crew, you didn't hear it that much. No. Mm -hmm. I know they, a lot of them use bad language. But. Uh, Did you smoke? I smoked. I smoked like a chimney. <laughs> but uh, everybody did. Uh, very few guys that I knew that didn't smoke in the service. What was your brand of choice? Lucky Strikes. Unfiltered? Uh, unfiltered? Unfiltered, yeah. Lucky Strike Green went to war. You remember that? Yeah, that saying. Then I smoked Kent's when I got home. When I got out of the service, I smoked Kent's. But I was, uh, when I got out of the service, I got out the day Roosevelt died. I was in a hospital for three months. I had a lung problem. And I was in the hospital till April, April the 12th of 45. That's when I got out. And when I was going home, we stopped in Dallas and, uh, all you heard was playing Home on the Range. And then that was Roosevelt's favorite song, Home on the Range. And it was the day he died. So when the, I always said, when the chief quit, I quit. And that's when I got out. <laughs> Interesting. So you get home. Now that you're home, now, now what do you do? Well, I didn't work for quite a while. I was on uh, disability from the service. And I didn't do anything. I fished. I lived in Florida at the time. And uh, I worked for the VA. I got a job with the Veterans Administration down there, putting, uh, getting guys into college. Most of them were blacks. They were going into agriculture. And uh, I made the mistake. I should have been going to college instead of, sending everybody else <laughs> but yeah so how long were you in florida then i was there about two years i guess i stayed there and then every time of his hunting season i was going north and the other people were coming south but uh i love my seasons i went back up and down with them so after florida where did you work what did you do i worked for continental can in Reading, I don't know if you ever heard of it. Big outfit, they made all the cans. We made fiber drums. And for during the war, they made the uh, bomb cases where they used to put the bombs in and to ship them. They made these out of like a cardboard, long tubes. <clears throat> but you must have seen the drums already that we made there in Reading, mm -hmm. the fiber drums. When did you retire? 37, I retired in 84. I'm retired, what, uh, 16 and 12, 28 years. Retired. Now what I do is get harassed because I live too long. He says, no wonder Social Security's going broke. <laughs> yeah. We can make a political statement out of this. <laughs> It's going to be on Facebook. <laughs> Are you Republican or Democrat? Uh, I'm a Democrat all my life because my dad was a Democrat and he worked hard all his life. He had a farm and then he also had other jobs. He had a grocery business. And during the Depression, we lost that. We lost our home in Laureldale. They built a nice home. Uh, at that time, it cost $15,000. He was going to have a butcher shop he built in the back. And he, was going, he was a butcher by trade. And uh, we lost that in the Depression. They owed $4,800 on it yet, and we lost it to the bank. That was a sad day in my life. I was a senior in high school at the time. What did you do? What did I do? We went over and be... I rented a home that my uncle owned for twenty dollars a month, and we lived there till the family broke up. Must have been a nice house. Yeah, twenty dollars a month. Yeah, it was a row home, <laughs> but the home that I still go by and visit many times in Laureldale. It was a big brick home. It's a beautiful home. Where's Laureldale? 
Outside of Reading, you know, where uh, let's say I can relate to it is, uh, you know, the Buckman's Bakery. You ever hear of that? You heard of uh, Excise Battery? Well, that's right in Laurel Dale in the lower end of it. What was the address? Do you remember? Pardon? What was the street address? Do you remember? Yeah, it was uh, 3310 Fairfield Street. 3310 Fairfield Street. And that's the house you rented from your uncle? No, that's the home we lived in. Okay. The one we lost. Okay. What happened, my dad had this store, the grocery business, and he gave a lot of credit out in the Depression. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd, I don't, you never had, had that experience. You went to the girl, your mom would send you to the store with a list of what you wanted and then tell them to put it on the books. Well, maybe they put it on the books, three, four dollars or something like that. Well, this all added up on my dad. And when it come time that he needed money, nobody had money. He lost his store business. He lost the home. He lost everything. He took a job on the highway. Hurt for Penn, Penn Highway. Mm -hmm. So when that experience happened, somebody had to tell you what was going on. How was that broken to you? You mean as far as... Uh, they said, we just lost everything. Now we're going to uh, move somewhere. How, how was that news delivered to you? It was sad. It was sad. My dad told me. He said, we just can't do it. So you still live in Reading today then, right? I live in Laureldale, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still driving, too. Still driving. I just had an examination a couple of months ago. They checked my eyes, they checked my heart and everything. I got an extension of my license for four years yet. I was a driver all my life, though. Before I went into service, when I got out of high school, I started as a truck driver. And I drove truck all over the northeastern United States, hauling pretzels for Bachman. And uh, I went to New York, Buffalo, Boston, Pittsburgh, Washington, Richmond, all around. I got paid three and a half cents a mile. And I was making money. I used to make $75, $80 a week. And the guys that I knew were making 20 Family. I have a family, and they're raising them on $20 a week. So then I drove a trailway bus, which was my ambition when I was a little kid. Mom took me to New York on a Greyhound bus, and I said, I want to be a bus driver when I grow up. And I completed my ambition. I didn't drive for Greyhound, but I drove for Trailways. I drove Allentown Reading Trailways. How many years did you do that? I did that for a couple of years. Then I got tired of that. I was on the extra board. And I'd get all the runs down to the, take the guys down fishing, charter work, you know, or ball games. And on the charter work, these guys come in the bus, they'd have a big tub like that, and that's where they'd put their beer in, right in the aisle. <laughs> but they'd, uh, they'd stop and uh, they'd ask for relief, and uh, I'd pull the bus over to the side, and they'd all get out. The buses didn't have toilets in them then days, and they'd get outside and all line up, you know. Today, we'd all go to jail <laughs> if you do that. <laughs> But that was, that was some. So since your flying days after World War II, did you fly after that? Yes, I did. I got a pilot's license. I don't know if you know Madera Field is. That was in Muhlenberg Township. I went on the GI Bill. I thought, well, I'm going to use it for something. And uh, I got a pilot's license. I learned to fly. Well, I didn't have to learn. In four hours, I was soloing. The, guy by the name of Rentschler. He was he owned the business there and he was my instructor. He says, I don't have to teach you anymore. He says, you're on your own. He got out of the airplane. He says, make a couple landings and take off. And I did. I got some co-pilot time when I was overseas, you know. I had an eager pilot. He used to like the like you got new engines on an aircraft, you had to fly it, test hops, you know, and stuff like that. So once in a while, I'd sneak in as a co-pilot with him. So, so I didn't realize you had a pilot's license when we talked like that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. How long did you fly for? 
how long? Yeah. Well, I couldn't afford it. I got a pilot's license, and uh, I, up here I used to fly. I, I don't know what it cost us in them days, but I think it was ten dollars an hour to rent a plane. <laughs> That's cheap, and I couldn't afford it. Yeah. That's very interesting. Though. So I didn't fly much anymore then. Any burning questions from the gallery back here? Are we covering everything here? You're doing good. I, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, it's been a long time since the war, but now when you go to that World War II reenactment at Reading, and, um, you know, you'll see some German pilots there, are like, signing autographs. And yeah. You see people in German uniforms. How do you feel about that? Do you have any kind of, I mean, they were trying to shoot you down. Do you feel? Well, there was a time I, I, I really didn't feel too good about that. But uh, I'm more or less resigned to the fact that they had a job to do, and just like we did, we had a job to do, and we did it. But we were a little better. So I tell you, the ones that I, the Japanese, I just I can't uh, accept them today yet. Mm -hmm. When I see how they treated our soldiers and stuff, like I had a fellow that graduated from high school with me by the name of Norm Christ. He was on that death march over there in the Philippines, but he made it. And uh, some of that stuff that went on over there, I, I, I just can't accept that today yet. I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't forgive him for it. Hmm. It's terrible it, how they punished him. But now, as far as the Germans, uh, I more or less accept that now, yeah. Have you stayed in touch with any of your old uh, cronies? I'm the only one left. I, the last one I talked to was my co-pilot. When he got out of the service, he was from Oklahoma. He went back there and he bought a ranch. And uh, this is what he told me when I called him. I got him through, found him through the computer. And uh, I said to him, I said, well, what are you doing, Sneed? He says, uh, I'm in the oil business. I said, you're in the oil business? He says, yeah, I bought this ranch, he said, and I got about a half a dozen oil wells on it. He says, the only thing is, he says, uh, I'm making so much money, he says, I got to keep drilling another well so I can pay the taxes. I said, you poor guy. <laughs> <coughs> he and I were pretty good buddies. He was my co-pilot. Yeah, Woodrow W. Sneed. But he lost his arm in a rig in one of the oil wells. He told me that anyway. Mm -hmm. But now I don't know if he's living yet or not. Did you have fun at the World War II Museum when we went there that day in June? Yeah. I was fascinated by your story. So I really enjoyed meeting you. Are you? Absolutely. That's why we're sitting here today. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm really indebted to you, I tell you. But, uh, no, it's, it's, it's always good when somebody's willing to talk about it. And, you know, your history's important to me. I think. Well, I, I, I don't think I've expressed myself like I did today, but uh, I tried the best I could. You did a fine job. <coughs> I I'm, I'm hope so. You did a fine job. Hey, guys, you have anything else? Yeah, two more. Um, Dick, did you ever get to visit any of the places that you had targeted? No, I didn't. No. I know some of our group, you know, they visited, went back, they had trips back to England, and they visited some of the places in Europe, I guess, that we bombed and everything, but I never did. No. Now, when you were in England, did any of your buddies ever get in any trouble with any of the locals? You know, there was a, a fair amount of downtime between missions, and I heard stories about guys getting into complications with the local <coughs> Not that I know. We we were situated out in a, like a boondock, you'd call it. Uh, the closest town was Mendelssohn, which was just a small, they only had one or two pubs in it. But uh, I don't know of it, like he says, I don't know if it's getting any trouble with the English or anything like that. I'll tell you, you go in a pub and you'd pull out a pack of cigarettes, <coughs> excuse me, but they'd look at you, you know, and you knew darn well what they wanted. So every time I'd be in a bar, or something, I'd offer them cigarettes and stuff. 
the stuff they smoked was terrible. <laughs> Seems to be the common statement. <laughs> yeah. How's your health these days? You feel good? I'm pretty good. I had a battle with cancer twice, and uh, I had a little bit of heart problem, a hardening, hardening of the arteries, which is common for an old man like me. But the cancer, I had uh, lymphoma. Next to my kidney, I had a tumor. And I went through chemo, radiation, and that's been 12 years ago. Can you imagine that? Then I had colon cancer. I had an operation for that. They took about four inches out of my colon. And that's been a few years ago. And that's plumbing's working pretty good. <laughs> that's I good. beat it again. <laughs> yeah. And I had a good life. Good life with them. It was good family. No regrets? No regrets. No, no regrets. The only regrets that uh, my wife was terrible smoker and a bingo player. Well, I didn't regret her playing bingo because that was something for her to do. But I did the smoking. And we all smoked. But one thing, when she got cancer, lung cancer, we all quit. I quit long before that myself. Yeah. I went to California in 67. The one boy was getting married and Linda and her husband were with me. And I got walking pneumonia out there. And I went to a doctor out there. Some friends of ours told me what doctor to go to and he was Spanish. And he read me the riot act about smoking. Well, I quit smoking. I didn't smoke from then on back. Hmm. So, he saved my life. And I was, I smoked quite a bit. I was a pack a day smoker like everybody else was in those days. Do you guys smoke? Never smoke. Never smoke? Good for you. Yeah. Well, even my stepson, John, Linda's brother. I never thought he would quit, but he was a truck driver. I never thought he'd quit, and he did. But he had his fingernails chewed back to the quick, I guess. <laughs> After he stopped smoking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. We have this covered, guys? Did you go? Yeah. You happy, Don? I'm very happy. I'm excited. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I sure appreciate this. Absolutely. You're like a pro, Pat. Yeah, you're good. You've done this before, right?